I'm Roger Baker, Executive Director of the Stratfor Center for Applied Geopolitics at RAIN, a global center of excellence for geopolitical intelligence and analysis. Learn how you can put geopolitics to work for your organization at RAINNetwork.com. Hello and welcome to a special edition episode of RAIN Insights. In preparation for RAIN and NASDAQ's upcoming summit on September 9th, RAIN founder and chief collaborative officer David Lawrence is sitting down with a number of industry leaders to discuss major compliance, security, and geopolitical issues that are top of mind for global organizations. In this episode, David chats with Phil Venables, the Chief Information Security Officer of Google Cloud, about the responsibility of company leadership in mitigating cyber risk. At Google Cloud, Phil leads the risk security, compliance, and privacy teams. Before joining Google, he was a partner at Goldman Sachs, where he held multiple roles over a long career, initially as their first Chief Information Security Officer, a role he held for 17 years. Outside of Google, Venables is a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. He also serves on the boards of the NYU Tandon School of Engineering, the NYU Stern Business School Volatility and Risk Institute, the Information Security and Privacy Advisory Board of NIST, and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. We hope you enjoy. Bill, thank you for uh, joining us. It's a great privilege and honor uh, to both reconnect and obviously to have your perspectives on a very, very important uh, landscape of risk. And what I wanted to take a moment to explain to the audience is that there are very few people, if any, whom I know are more expert in this area and have done uh, more to both educate and to address the profound issues of cybersecurity and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, use a cliche to say thank you for your service, uh, because you've been incredibly central and um, important in bridging public private sector efforts, but helping people to understand institutions to understand what's happening and more importantly, to address the issues. So with that as an introduction, Phil, thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. And uh, and you know, like uh, I think a lot of us, you know, it's um, fairly straightforward okay. to accumulate a lot of experience when you've been doing this stuff for decades. I think. Okay, so that's great. Uh, anyway, I I thought it'd be helpful for the audience just to get a quick overview, a quote of your professional journey uh, in this space. And when we were at Goldman Sachs um, together, uh, certainly as you know, the world was becoming digitized. I don't think the term cyber threats cyber attacks or cyber security necessary necessarily were even coined and you were you know central to the effort of uh, coming up with you know the education protocols to make people aware of what was coming but also some of the terminology so maybe you could give the um the audience a, a quick overview of a very distinguished uh, professional career yeah yeah sure i mean like i'll, I'll keep it brief i mean i i started off my career at the Early days of the internet as a as a software engineer rather than working in security, and I think there's a lot of people that have come into security over the years from other fields, whether it's um, intelligence service, law enforcement, forensics, software engineering, infrastructure engineering, and uh, you know, I'm one of the people that came into this from uh, the software engineering side, and um, and back in the early days in the '90s when. Uh, uh, when we were really expanding the internet, most of security work was software engineering because you were having to build a lot of things because there, quite frankly, wasn't much to buy then. Um, and it's interesting to see the full procession of people's careers because I think, again, it's become quite an engineering-centric discipline uh, in most organizations. Um, and so I did various different roles, um, software engineering, then working on security, and then ultimately becoming a... Uh, Chief Security Officer of various different organizations. Um, I spent most of my career, David, as you know, with, uh, together uh, at Goldman Sachs. I did multiple roles at Goldman Sachs. I was their first Chief Information Security Officer, um, and I did that for about 17 years. Then I uh, was Chief Risk Officer for Enterprise Risk. Then I did some other board, customer, and uh, private equity advisory work before uh, coming over where I am now at Google, which was about 
just coming up for four years ago. Uh, and I have a number of different roles at Google. I'm the chief information security officer for Google Cloud, covering security, privacy, and compliance. And I also do some broader security engineering work for the rest of Google. Uh, and also, I'm privileged to do a lot of customer-facing work, both with boards, executive teams, CIOs, CTOs, and chief security officers at uh, many companies that are onboarding to the cloud or modernizing or digitizing their services. So. Uh, uh, it's re re really good fun to uh, keep working with the community as well as working on some pretty hard um, security and computer science problems. I was going to say your humility uh, uh, precedes you because you left out some of the significant work that you uh, do in collaboration with supporting government efforts and government private sector. Um, yeah. Oh, no, that's right. Yeah, I should have mentioned. Um, yeah, I'm on... Um, the President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology at the, at the White House, as well as doing a, you know, a reasonable amount of advisory work for the U.S. intelligence community. And I'm also you know, privileged to be on the, uh, on the Information Security Advisory Board at NIST, where we've been supporting all the work on various NIST standards, not just cybersecurity, but um, cryptography and a range of other things. So that's been a, a, a privilege to, uh, to serve my adopted nation as part of those various different initiatives. <laughs> All right, right. Uh, I, I like to think we recruited you. Uh, so um, maybe um, a, a reasonable place to start the conversation, Phil, is uh, to give us a, sort of a state of the union overview of where we are in terms of the cyber landscape, uh, our digital environment and the types of threats and issues that enterprises, whether they're in the private sector or public sector, have to be thinking about. Yeah, sure. So it's, I think when you kind of look back at kind of the history of the cybersecurity threat landscape, I think what you look back and you see, and this is certainly the case going forward, is that threats and attacks that come from that have naturally tracked how much we've digitized and connected our world. So whenever we always think about attacks are increasing, it's not just because the number of attackers are increasing or their sophistication is increasing. It's also because we're noticing it a lot more because we've essentially digitized the planet. Um, if you think about this, even just in the past five to 10 years, the difference between just how much of our lives are connected online, all of our businesses are, all of our interaction with government and public services are, all of our health is managed online, our finances are managed online, our critical infrastructure is connected, just everything as we saw with some recent outages like the CrowdStrike and Microsoft event that um, just even a narrowly deployed product in the grand scheme of things can have tremendous impact if it fails. So I think the threats and attacks have kind of come with the extent that we, which we've digitized. And those threats have gone from the early days, they were just kind of nuisance threats um, all the way through the mass worms and viruses that had quite disruptive impact, which then evolved into uh, significant and quite sophisticated activity from nation states and organized criminals, both for financial gain, stealing intellectual property, causing disruption or destruction to try and influence geopolitical events. And of course, those uh, particularly nation state attacks have become more directed and more advanced. And then again, in the criminal backdrop, we see massive, uh, essentially, targets of opportunity being exploited for ransomware and extortion purposes. Uh, and we've seen big impact in many sectors, big headline risks in the healthcare sector, um, <clears throat> where a number of institutions have been pretty um, you know, extensively harmed. Um, and then also we see the development of the attacker community has become more of its own uh, black market ecosystem for buying and selling stolen credentials, stolen information, buying and selling access. And it's quite amazing just how sophisticated particularly criminal gangs have got for that. Uh, and then also now we see nation states. I think there's been a lot released on this year in various public forum about the extent to which certain nation states have been discovered uh, having pre-positioned attack capability inside US and other countries' critical infrastructure, likely for the sole purpose to actually use and exploit and cause disruption at times of geopolitical tension or, or outright conflict. 
Um, and then we also see, of course, we can't not talk about AI, but the, the broader sets of threats around misinformation and influence, influence operations, which you know, continue to play out in elections and other uh, similar situations around the world that, you know, of course, happened before AI was a useful tool, but we're, we're going to naturally see AI be a, uh, a tool used by nation states and other groups to try and drive misinformation. I think the final thing I'll say, which is an interesting, you know, where we began on a lot of these issues, even before we'd kind of digitized everything, is we always have to worry about insider risk. You know, if you think about even a bank in the 70s and 80s before everything was connected, we're dealing with insider threats, coercion, you know, bribery, extortion, placed insiders. Um, and I think that shifted uh, to being a lot of digital attacks. But as we get better at defending digital attacks, we're inevitably going to see the return of the uh, the extortion, coercion, and other placement and infiltration of insiders uh, as being more economic for attackers to do the digital attacks. So I think we also have got to think about how do we go back to the good old-fashioned means of reducing our vulnerability to significant insider threats as well as defending against external attacks. And somewhat uh, call it coincidence, Bill, since we scheduled um, this conversation, uh, we had the situation with CrowdStrike and the disruption uh, across all enterprises. Um, there was a certain irony that CrowdStrike, of course, uh, one of the leading cybersecurity companies and a great company, but that that company, in fact, became a vulnerability uh, within the system. And uh, just within the last 24 hours, the uh, pronouncements by the FBI and the Intel community that uh, state sponsorship out of Iran uh, attempted or did hack into uh, the systems of our presidential campaigns. Um, so just to underscore your point, uh, every every day sort of seems to bring a headline and and um, it's increasing. Um, let me, um, I want to test out a thesis, which I mentioned to your team, uh, because you, you referenced um, within enterprises, uh, it's very much a engineering centric uh, responsibility, uh, cybersecurity. And as you know, most board members and C-suite uh, representatives are not uh, technologists, they're not engineers. Um, but what I have found is helpful, and I'm, I'm going to lean into what I learned from you, both at Goldman and, and, and from some of your speeches and papers and things like that, is that basically the threats we're facing uh, are very, very old. Uh, I like to say they go back to the times of the Bible uh, in that we're seeing fraud and extortion and theft and espionage and insider threats and disinformation campaigns and, uh, you know, what I refer to ransom um, efforts. All those are crimes that, you know, show up in the Bible. Uh, but what has changed, of course, are the portals through which um, these crimes can be committed, the scalability, lower barriers of entry, and uh, the fact that um, these crimes can be committed um, remotely, uh, very often anonymously, and very often with a high degree of impunity. And um, maybe, because I know you've done uh, a great deal of educational work, but uh, if you can, perhaps demystify this for board members and C-suites about how to think about these issues, why they're not going to go, they're not going away, and how enterprises have to think about them, even if you're not uh, an engineer, even if you're not a technologist, even if you have to get help uh, loading software, you know, into, into your laptop. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's interesting because one of the things I think your framing's correct that, you know, when you think about this broad set of threats and risks, it's important to think about the attacker's objectives. And, you know, I always like to say attackers have bosses and budgets just like everybody else. They have an objective. They actually have limited resources. They have um, campaigns they have to run, whether it's criminal or nation state. And the good news about that is that means you can actually kind of impose some cost on the attackers. 
and um, and uh, and play with their economics by having better defenses and understanding how to make yourself less of a target or less of a vulnerable target that they can exploit. Uh, I think the other thing that comes up a lot is it's absolutely correct <clears throat> that we have to think of this as a business problem or a mission problem, depending what organization you're in. And at the same time, you have to think about it as a deep technical problem. I think that there's organizations, you get this wrong sometimes in one of two respects, is they treat it purely as a business problem and neglect the technical details of driving a great defendable technical architecture. And then some organizations approach it purely as a technical problem. And then the technical risks are disconnected from the business risks and they kind of get the prioritization wrong. So I think it's, it's really important for boards and executive teams um, uh, the, the, to, to actually think about how they exhibit their tone at the top and not just saying security or risk management or resilience is a priority, but joining that tone at the top with the right resources in the ranks to get the job done. And I think sometimes that you see a lot of pounding of the table of boards going, security is our number one priority. And then you actually go talk to the CIO or the chief technology officer or the chief security officer. And you go, does it feel to you like it's a top priority? And they basically go, no, because um, there's a disconnect between management stated intent and the actual thing that needs to happen. And, and I think sometimes that's because historically a lot of organizations have approached security as if I just buy some security products, I'm going to be okay. And the reality is, and I know you know this, David, and I'm sure many in the audience do, the reality is if you buy a bunch of security products and try and deploy it on an old, outdated infrastructure or old, outdated business processes, it's like building on a foundation of sand. It's going to maybe give you some short-term benefit, but it's not sustainable and certainly wouldn't resist the stronger forces of more advanced attacks. And so in a lot of organizations that we see that do this well have redesigned and upgraded their old IT systems to more modern systems that are more defendable where security is built in, not bolted on after the fact. And, and the great thing as part of doing that, and this is the real message for boards, is if you design and implement and give your IT team and your business IT teams the support to build a modern technology environment, you don't just get better security resilience, you actually get better commercial gains, you get better support, you get better agility, you reduce your time to market for products. And so I think it's 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 important for boards to recognize that you can do that and get security as well as business benefit at the same time. The, the other thing I'd say on boards is there's a little bit of a tone sometimes in the security profession um, and it's sometimes encouraged by various parties that security teams should dumb down this topic, you know, don't talk in such complicated ways to boards. And, and, and like that, that's right to some degree. Um, I think you know, boards don't need to necessarily understand the deep technical detail of security. But at the same time, security teams, I don't think, should be so apologetic to have to talk in some detail about the risks and the threats and what they have to implement as technology mitigation. And I give you a good example, and again, I know you know this, David. Is is you know, so like most boards of most companies actually have a high expectation of expertise. You know, if you're on the board of a bank, um, you have to. I went when I was on the Goldman Sachs Bank board. I went through. You know, even though I'd worked there for a while, I went through training on credit and market risk and financial risk, so I could have the right degree of expertise such that the risk management teams, when they come in and brief the board, didn't have to dumb everything down into red, yellow, and green signals. Uh, and similarly, you know, if you're on the board of a pharmaceutical company, you have medical doctors and research scientists. If you're on the board of an energy company, they're typically industry experts in various different aspects of safety or industry expertise. And so I think it's reasonable for us to expect boards and executive teams, again, not to be experts, but to have more expertise in these subjects. And it's on the security teams to drive the education so that they don't have to dumb things down when they're presenting important risks. And that certainly doesn't happen in other specialty risk areas that affect companies. They make sure that there is that expertise and that knowledge on, on the board such that the risk teams can engage more deeply on those topics. And I think that's where we have to end up in cyber and other related topics.
So it's interesting. I'm, 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 let me try to summarize a couple of takeaways. One, um, since we've all been in front of boards and, and been part of that process, it's not a 20 minute or 30 minute presentation to the boards uh, every quarter. Um, that's a, you didn't quite say that, but uh, I'm taking that away. Two, yeah. there is a foundational education that has to be provided to the board members about this risk and probably updated. You know, there are all sorts of continuing education requirements in various professions. Uh, I'm sort of uh, inferring that from a board perspective, because the nature of this risk is so important and, and quite frankly, um, so systemic, that there is a need for uh, foundational knowledge for board members and for continued education. Yep. No, I think that's exactly right. And I think, you know, the, the two best practices I see on companies that do this well is, is, is how you've described it. One is their boards and particular individual board members have a, quite extensive meetings and discussions with the security and the technology and risk teams in and around the board meeting, not just in the formal board presentation. Um, and they also get a lot of education as part of board member onboarding to this risk, just like they would get a lot of education and onboarding about all of the other risks and dynamics of the company of which they're joining the, the board of. And I think the second best practice is companies that do this well don't just approach it as oversight of security. They approach it as oversight of their entire technology strategy of which security is an important element and an important side effect of doing the technology well. I, I, I give you another example. It always fascinates me is, you know, one of the, again, one of the most strong indicators of how good a company is at security is it's how much they have their software under control. So they do, do they know where all their software is? Is it all tested, reproducibly built, capable of being deployed? And a good metric for the board is like what percentage of that company's software is under that degree of control so that it can be managed and reproduced and taken care of. And sometimes then when I suggest that, people will come back and say, well, that's, you know, that's a kind of an in-the-weeds technical metric. The board can't be expected to understand that. And I go, well, why not? Imagine you know, if you were the board and you were sitting with the chief financial officer and the board said, are all of our finances under control? And the, and the CFO said, well, you know, it's kind of we've got spreadsheets here and there and there's, there's a ledger over here, but it's not reconciled with this other ledger. And this, you know, I just really can't tell you how much money we've got. You know, the board would ask for a new CFO pretty quickly. Um, but if the board asks the CIO or the CTO, is all of our software under control? Very few companies are going to give a great answer. Now, that's not to criticize the CIO or the CTO uh, because this is a hard problem. And it's especially a hard problem to solve without board and CEO assistance to drive the priority. But then what happens then is the board should say, well, we should get all of our software under control and they should charter and fund the CIO or the CTO with support of the CISO to do that. And then when you get to that point, you then get a lot of good side effects. And so I think the board engagement at a little bit deeper level, again, not down in the weeds, but at a reasonable level and driving, has a company got a good technology strategy that has security and resilience as a part of it is, 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 a, is, a, is a common practice you see in organizations that do this really well. And I know many in the audience will understand this, but I, I just wanted to underscore your point about the software and understanding uh, whether it's under control. You, of course, are, are pointing out that um, the chain of security is only as strong as the weakest link, and many of these attacks come through um, flaws and vulnerabilities in company software. And uh, sometimes it says, I'll call it mundane, is the updated security has not been, uh, you know, been downloaded to a particular system. But that that's really your point, that software is has been a, uh, a place of vulnerability for enterprises. And if it's not under control and not up to date and not uh, enhanced with uh, updated security, it's, it's a vulnerability for the company. Yeah, exactly. I think the other thing as well is I think a lot of our metrics that many organizations use are excessively focused on lagging rather than leading indicators. So there's a lot of obsession over, in some cases quite rightly, over security breaches, malware events, data leakage events. 
uh, and it's important to track those, but I think it's also important to shift to track the leading indicators that if you do those well, will almost guarantee your outcomes. And again, I, as you can probably tell, I like to use analogies. So imagine a manufacturing analogy. You know, if you're making um, processes or pharmaceuticals or motor vehicles, you have a production line. And clearly, those organizations monitor the quality of what comes off the production line. But what most organizations do that do this well is they monitor leading metrics like is the raw materials good or the staff trained on how to do quality right are the machines well maintained um, are we monitoring the life cycle of the product through the process i think we need to adopt the same thing in cyber and there's many examples of what those leading indicators could be one is what we've just talked about on what percentage of your software is reproducible there could be many other things like how long would it take to essentially restart your company in the event of a disaster and do you actually measure that uh, do you have a good inventory of everything in your company? Do you know where all your data is and is are the right accesses? Do you have a record of who all your employees are? Um, and there's a whole set of things that if you get those right, you get business agility, you get efficiency, effectiveness, and you get security and resilience for, uh, as shown in the lagging indicators. And again, that's where I think boards and CEOs can encourage and drive the CIO and the CISO to shift from lagging to leading indicators, because I think that gets security and gets the right commercial outcomes. Yeah. So I want to, again, underscore a theme that you're emphasizing. Very often people see the security as a, just a pure cost issue. Uh, and what you are underscoring is that when you get the protocols correct uh, and you're focused on security, there are ancillary benefits that come from commercial and operational efficiency as well as um, what I'll refer to as insights about your business that you might not otherwise have. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and I think, we again, we should have higher expectations on ourselves as security and risk professionals that when we're pushing forward risk mitigation, that we're always seeking those adjacent benefits. So I, I know organize, I mentioned the inventory issue is, you know, many organizations that have got their inventory of people assets technology software and data under very good control i don't know any organization that's done that that hasn't found a large amount of money to be gained in efficiencies by switching off things that are not being used effectively or disconnecting vendors that they still have under contract but they're not really using that much anymore there's just so much cost feed up as part of having a good inventory and then when you've got a good inventory the security and resilience is so much easier that's great uh let me dive back into um uh, trailing versus leading indicators of risk um i've been a firm believer as, as you were at goldman sachs something happens to someone else in your industry uh, could it happen here? What are the lessons that are being learned? Uh, that's one aspect, perhaps, of board responsibility, C-suite responsibility. But then you're also talking about leading indicators. And so maybe you can talk about the importance of what I refer to as acquired wisdom in terms of what has happened in the past, what is happening now, but how to look out at the horizon to understand what could happen and what you have to prepare for. Yeah, and I, I think what and again another amazing practice I've you know we've all done and I've seen done at many companies is what you're describing in, in essence is around incident learning or kind of close call near miss analysis. And again, another, when you look at companies that are great at this, they have this kind of institutional paranoia that whenever anything goes wrong, they try and learn from it so that uh, at least the same thing doesn't happen again, even though they may not permanently eradicate that risk. And I think great organizations also look at those kind of close calls and actual incidents at other organizations. Uh, I know in various organizations in my career, I've probably got more things done and funded and prioritized because I've been able to point to another bank that had a problem and said, we don't want that to be us. And maintaining a library of sort of shovel ready projects that are just ready to go when people are feeling the emotion of uh, that close call or that incident that happened to another organization and this is a great reason for doing a lot of the 
uh, being part of the community and being part of things like information sharing analysis centers and other organizations where you can kind of trade in information around what's been happening in the in the industry i think it's also as well david when you talk about looking over the horizon why it's important to think about threat intelligence and where the threat actors are going and what their capabilities are now i think sometimes threat intelligence gets a bit of a bad name because when everybody hears a threat intelligence they think of all these large feeds of information that indicators of compromise and virus signatures and other things that just you know those are important but they should just flood into your environment to automatically update things what i'm talking about is the more strategic threat intelligence where you're analyzing where threat actors are going what their objectives are what their capabilities are going to be how they're attacking other organizations in your sector and what that means for you and then doing the appropriate analysis to brief leadership and the board as well as the IT teams on what's actually going on and evidence in there i think and having a good cycle and feedback loop or flywheel of how all that happens i think is very very powerful for security and risk teams and again you know as you and i used to collaborate over many years it's also a great means of getting the different risk teams whether it's the forensic team the investigative team the physical security the cyber the operational teams the fraud teams getting all those together in almost like a virtual fusion team to just talk about the tips and cues off each other promotes a lot of teamwork as well and um just in terms of as you think about the threat intel bill um one of the benefits about being in a democratic society there's a lot of open source information you referenced uh, NIST uh, the government does do briefings um people go out and they make speeches and uh, very often I, I found there's almost a numbness that has set in that uh, you know an agency had his warning about something and you know people take it seriously but they don't necessarily say well there must be a reason why they're going public on this and so maybe you could uh, share because you've been at the center of this uh, the different streams of information that can be valuable to a board member as well as c-suite uh, representatives in terms of the information that's out there and how to think about the future and the potential threat intel without trying to drink from the fire hydrant yeah i mean I, th- i think there's a number of pretty good sources i'm you know i'm going to try and be careful not to kind of you know pound my own drum for google but we've you know we've done uh, some interesting work on our board insights reports where we try and uh, and also our, our colleagues inside google uh, security our mandiant team have done a lot of work on distilling large amounts of threat information into some pretty accessible chunks of strategic advice um and so i think it's useful for board members probably to ask their ceos or their main vendors like google or other companies to you know if they're not getting the information they need to make those strategic assessments um then you know there's always work to be done where a ceo can work with us or other companies to to get that um you know again not dumbed down but at least but a strategic level rather than a tactical level view of the threats and um and again you used this phrase earlier kind of looking over the horizon a useful way I've always found to do this is to say look where where are the threats going to be in several years what are going to be commodity attacks against us and is our control upgrade uh plan on a path to stay ahead of where the attackers are going to come at us and what they're going to do and i think having the board and the ceo engage on that discussion of are we staying ahead of the threat or are we behind the threat and what does it look like on the long term horizon and what does it mean for the long term funding plan given where we project the threat actors are going to be is a means of engaging with the board on something that could actually to then just be quite a dry subject um again the other thing as well is it's always important to I've always found with boards just as with any leadership meeting having real life war stories and case studies in your own industry in a place that's kind of close to heart is uh, is always is always interesting again you know the various banks I've worked at the most exciting risk management meetings are the are the 10 minute case study where you show what terrible thing happened to another bank and how what we have to do to make sure it never happens to us everybody sits up straight at that moment and pays attention so uh over the years we kind of you know as I know you did made more and more of the board engagement more 
case study um, kind of you know, incident review oriented rather than dry analytical risk management oriented because it just works very effectively. Right. So I, I, I don't want to lose these threads because uh, they're very important, but uh, I'll, I'll refer to it as the ability to tell a story. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and people remember, okay. Uh, and it could be about an event that they read about, but they didn't quite understand. And, and, and you start to explain and to understand the, uh, I'll call it the order of repercussions or consequences that can flow from a problem. Uh, obviously disruption of a business, but now we're in an environment with regulatory investigations and class action suits, and ultimately finger pointing and congressional hearings and uh, not to mention the loss of client and uh, customer confidence, and et cetera, and the loss of contracts uh, for that matter. Uh, but um, the ability to have a file uh, that you can break out and tell stories with uh, always invaluable and also invaluable in terms of making sure uh, this is really a message for the CISOs that they can get the funding they need and the board support. It becomes a cultural issue. People remember it. Uh, I'll also say that uh, if I can expand upon that theme, Phil, uh, companies sometimes, you know, with different generations and um, of leadership and, and, and there is movement in every organization, sometimes they lose institutional knowledge about what has happened in the past within their own institutions. So um, that sense of history, um, we'll call it the acquired wisdom within an institution also can be lost. So yet another reason. Actually, that's, that's an interesting one. I, uh, I, I've never done this in my own professional life, but I know um, um, one government organization, um, and I, you know, one IC organization, and I think NASA actually do this as well, is they have like a, a almost like an internal museum of failure, um, exactly. and they bring yeah. new people through that. Of this, these are the things that happened over the past 20, 30 years, what we learn from, and then this is why we do the things we do. And uh, and it's interesting, uh, you know, I've done this in various kind of boot camps and training exercises is to, you know, show people the controls that we have and what's the historical reason why we have it. Because I think you're absolutely right that you, you just have to keep reminding people of like the, you know, almost like the, the history or the archaeology of the layers of controls and why they exist. Um, because that's the other thing that ha that tends to happen sometimes is I've seen this paradox in organizations where you have you have great controls and so nothing bad happens, which is great. But then everybody says, why are we spending money, money on all of these controls when nothing's happening? And, and you go, it's because of the controls. And some organizations actually then start cutting budgets because they're not having any problems and then talk about leading versus lagging, two years later, they start having problems because they eroded their control base. So I think the CISOs and others being able to tell the story of the existence of controls um, is a good thing that nothing's happening. That's an evidence of it working, not an evidence of it being a waste of money. You, you didn't want to pound the drums uh, too loud, uh, but I, I will give you um, a, a great shout out. Um, your efforts at Google and Mandiant, et cetera, to get information out of the public domain. Too often, um, the stuff is out there and people you know, don't necessarily see it. I like to say I'm, I made a living both at the US Attorney's Office and Goldman Sachs and now Rain, just making sure people saw what was out there and yeah. kind of understood it. Um, let me um, talk a little bit, because you touched upon the cultural issue and, and security as a, um, you saw this as a security issue, as a business issue. It's also uh, increasingly, because you alluded to this, uh, a geopolitical issue. And with the global nature of business, the importance of uh, the, the companies that are operating in different markets to understand the geopolitical environment uh, that they're in, and also to understand, I'll call it doing an inventory of what, what is inside my company, what is inside my agency that is potentially valuable. Uh, I like to think, and, and maybe you're, you, of course, are closer to it. People didn't quite understand why hospitals were being hacked for, you know, the information and other things. And um, you may recall uh, a number of years ago, the um, basically the, the personnel office of the U.S. government was hit and, and stuff. But maybe you can share with people uh, sort of the geopolitical angle and the importance 
of what I'll refer to as self-awareness uh, for enterprises to understand what they own, what they control, that could potentially be of value and make an attractive target. Yeah, I mean, I think I think most organizations um, are targets of opportunity, and so if they if they present weakness, particularly for ransomware actors or other organized criminals that are seeking to um, either take or destroy or kind of coerce or extort their way into financial gain. Um, many organizations, they just present vulnerability, they become a target of opportunity. However, there are also many organizations, either because of the information they have, um, for example, a defense industrial based company or a government agency, or in some cases, as you described, a a healthcare organization where the medical records of certain individuals is useful for nation state actors for various espionage or counter espionage purposes. Um, those organizations are more directed targets. Um, we've also seen critical infrastructure like water utilities, electricity companies, other types of organizations uh, be subject to um, exploitation because that might be useful for an adversary in times of conflict or near conflict to demonstrate the ability to uh, to harm our internal infrastructure the other one we increasingly see is organizations that are clear leverage points for either nation states or organized criminals to get at everybody else so for example you've seen some of the breaches at some of the um, large tech companies you know we've seen the various events at microsoft that was investigated in the DHS Cyber Safety Review Board report. Uh, we've seen a number of identity and authentication providers um, compromised. We've seen some of the events associated with various data warehouse companies. And so those are not targets of opportunity. Those are targets of a leverage point that gets access into the to the rest of the environment. So when I kind of look at the threat, if you're a, an organization, um, you're either a target of opportunity or you've got something that people really, really want, or you're a big point of leverage to get to all of the other things to create targets of opportunity or to access um, something that you know something that the attacker, whether it's a criminal or a nation state, wants. So, I, I, having a continued, up to date understanding of not just whether you've got critical assets, but whether you're a critical leverage point for attackers to get to other um, things that changes your assessment of how critical you are that's a great point uh in the short time we have remaining um i wanted to touch upon uh two quick things uh give you again a shout out on uh, the efforts to educate train and credential people uh to quite frankly be of use within their organizations uh as cyber se security I don't want to use the word experts, but a, a, a basically to have proficiency in cybersecurity and be able to sort of share that knowledge. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that program and, and the training. And I know a number of uh, younger people, but also a number of senior people who have gone through the training and loved it. And uh, because there's a, a lot of debate about um, the disparities of wealth and opportunity in this uh, country, uh, the price point for the service, the certification is incredible. Uh, right. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, we, we, we created a few years ago, we created an overall Google career certificates program, which was designed for people with a very limit, limited experience to become proficient, at least to, to an entry kind of analyst level in an array of things from cloud management, project management, networking, systems administration. Um, and then a couple of years ago, we created this cybersecurity certificate um, that's designed, again, to get people without any experience up to a kind of a base analyst entry level um, so they could get their foot on the career ladder in various different companies. Um, I, we've all heard about the, you know, the amount of unfilled vacancies in cybersecurity. I think, to be honest, that, that's overblown um, in terms of the numbers people talk about, but it's certainly true that 
there's a there's 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 gaps in everybody's hiring pipelines for cybersecurity. And again, many organizations are actually not just thinking about how do they hire experienced people, but how do they get more people through the uh, the junior levels um, and the entry levels in their organization, even if it's hiring people you know who have a lot of experience in another industry we've also done some work on kind of cross career training taking people with you know 20 30 years of experience in one thing cross training them on cyber or other disciplines because those skills they had in their prior career are tremendously transferable and give them a give them an advance in the uh, in the cyber security domain and um, the other thing as part of launching this we also worked with a lot of companies to make sure that these certificates were accepted as part of their entry-level credentials because um, there's often a bit of a catch-22 where everybody says they need more people but then they set a bar so high that they can almost guarantee they never get any people and so we tried to break that cycle again not just on the on the supply side of new people but also making sure the demand side was ready to accept them and we had some pretty big flagship fortune 500 companies that that still participate in that the other thing i'd say is you know while and i kind of hinted at this while it's very important to increase the number of cybersecurity professionals we've also been very focused on again the other side of the balance sheet which is how do we 10x the productivity of the cybersecurity professionals we've already got and so we and others are doing a lot of work in the industry around automation um, and other approaches to reduce the toil of what it takes to do cybersecurity jobs. That's improvements in process and tooling and training just to raise productivity and actually try and improve the the day-to-day experience of even experienced cybersecurity professionals just by removing that toil. And so we're working both sides of the balance sheet, raising the supply of people and then uh, uh, tempering the demand by increasing the productivity of the people we've already got. And, uh, you know, we're starting to see, we're starting to see that play out. So I, I refer to this to uh, various clients as they're democratizing uh, this yep. space and not everybody can have a uh, Phil Venables inside of their organization. And so this is a terrific uh, effort. Uh, just in closing, um, I want to ask you, so the question that, uh, uh, since you and I both wear glasses, the ophthalmologist uh, asks when checking our eyesight and lenses, uh, you know, better, worse, better, worse. Things are getting better, they're getting worse. And, um, from a uh, metaphor standpoint, um, people hearing this, C-suite, board members, various agency heads, um, best way to get sort of stay on top of things and to have the necessary checklists that they can take back to their organizations. In other words, yeah. this is your opportunity to write a prescription for people. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'll be, I'll hedge this a little bit. I'm, I'm short-term pessimistic long-term optimistic so i i'm short-term pessimistic i think there's a lot of pain still to be felt by many organizations there's a lot of attacks and attackers out there there's still a lot of targets of opportunity we see it every day so um i don't think in the short term 6 12 18 24 months it's going to feel like it's getting any better but the reason i'm long-term optimistic you know two three years out and certainly five years out, is we're already implementing and more and more companies are implementing a higher baseline of controls that are capable of defending against most of the attacks that are happening today. This could be stronger so-called multi-factor authentication. So adding additional authentication layers beyond simple guessable or stealable passwords is segmenting your environment so you reduce the blast radius of events it's uh, modernizing your technology so you can keep it up to date all the stuff we talked about earlier and all of those these basic what some people describe as cyber hygiene it's not it's simple to imagine i wouldn't say it's easy to do because it often requires a lot of upgrades but it's something you absolutely have to do and it gives you many other benefits and I think organizations, if they were going to spend, um, you know, spend a dollar on uplifting their infrastructure and modernizing their technology versus a dollar on security products, I'd go with the modernizing infrastructure and then also implementing some of those 
more advanced controls that mitigate attacks like multi-factor authentication. And I think doing that, you see organizations that have done that have substantial, almost outsized improvements in their security. Now, to be clear, they still could be vulnerable to a very, very targeted, directed, advanced attack. But if we're honest, for most organizations, 99% of the attacks, you look at them and think, well, they could have solved for that by having not just having passwords or actually keeping their systems not up to date every day, but even up to date for six months. Um, and so there's many, many basic things that are that require some discipline, but they're not not really that hard to do with some commitment that just takes so many attacks off the table and make it harder for the attackers. So I, I think there's a way to do this, and there's many organizations are doing it every day. It just requires commitment and discipline to do it. So, Phil, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your continued service. Uh, with your permission, we'll work with your team to pull together some of the materials that uh, Google has put out, Demandiant and the checklist. And uh, we'll, we'll send some links over from NIST so that people listening to this uh, will also have some takeaway materials uh, that they can bring back to their organizations. Yep. That's great. Thank you for inviting me. It's been, uh, a, been a pleasure. Thanks for all the great always, questions. Stay safe, Bill. Keep us safe. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to this special edition episode of the Rain Insights series from Rain Network. For more content from the Rain and NASDAQ Summit, please visit the link in the description.